All right, welcome. So today we have a special guest. We have Liz Curran with us. I'm so excited. So Liz Curran is a holistic cancer health coach. She was inspired to become a health coach after caring for her sister with an aggressive breast cancer diagnosis. She watched her sister struggle during treatment with feeling powerless to aid her own healing. She believed there had to be a roadmap out there to guide people to play a stronger role in their own health. Liz believes radical remission is that map. She uses the 10 healing factors in her own life and guide others to do the same. Welcome Liz to the Stress Nurse Wellness Podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Thanks for having me here tonight. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I live in New Jersey. I have three kids and a dog and a husband, and I'm hoping they'll all stay nice and quiet for us tonight. <laughs> um, I have, uh, so I guess a little history on how I came to where I am. Um, I have a background in two degrees in marketing and worked in that world for a while. And then I took some time to spend with my three kids as they were born. And then um, while my youngest was two, uh, was when my sister got sick. And um, as you described just now, um, you know, I was, I acted as one of the caregiving roles for her in that year of her um, diagnosis and her treatment. And um, so during that time, I learned a lot. And um, as you know, yourself with that kind of significant impact on your life, it does take it a, a turn, you know, sometimes it takes a turn and, and allows you onto a new path. So um, I had already been in school to become a health coach and I ended up channeling that to become a cancer health coach for people who are living with a diagnosis that need um, that kind of uh, relationship. Oh, nice. Nice. And how did you get connected with uh, Health Navigators? So I actually co-founded the Health Navigators last summer with two other coaches. We um, are all certified by Dr. Kelly Turner, the author of Radical Remission. Um, which we can talk about in a little bit. So she trained us to be teachers for a workshop that she created to implement these 10 healing factors that are outlined in the book for cancer patients. And it's really, those ultimately are lifestyle changes that people can make in conjunction with whatever type of treatment they're having. And it's forelaid really beautifully into um, a coaching program after we did a bunch of workshops and last spring we all went virtual with the pandemic. So we ended up providing a group coaching following a very large workshop that we had. And then the health navigators kind of was born from that as we decided to grow a community and provide social support for people that seemed to be much needed uh, during the pandemic. And also for, you know, for cancer patients who typically are immune compromised and kind of living, um, in almost a, a quarantine state more often than not, unfortunately. <laughs> right, so, right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so we created this organization so that people had a place to come and we do lots of different events for them and provide coaching and just a safe space for them to connect that, um, you know, with a group of like, like-minded kind of inspired cancer patients. Yeah. And it's almost better, you know, that it is virtual with the pandemic because you Absolutely. have a lot more people to log on. You're in the comfort of your own home. Now, have you seen growth in the program since, you know, the whole pandemic? Oh yeah. Yes. Well, uh, oddly enough, we got certified by Dr. Turner just September before um, the pandemic hit. So we were just getting our feet wet in the, the world of providing the workshops uh, we had a very, very large workshop last spring that had about 400 people. And then we kind of knew that there was a lot of interest during this new era of Zoom and, and really being able to accommodate people connecting virtually. So we decided to, that's really when Radical Remission became much more accessible virtually was when we did the workshop. And then, you know, me and these other couple of coaches really decided to dive in and and provide a lot of this, uh, you know, at home remote setting for all the things that they, you know, were probably getting more at their hospital and, and in person before. Awesome. Now let's talk about the 10 factors. I'm excited yeah. to really get into it and learn more about it. So yeah. can you give us some more information on what are these 10 factors and why are they so important? Absolutely. So 
what I love, I, I'm, you know, very passionate about the radical remission program. And I do love explaining where they came from, because it's really a very, uh, really inspiring story. So Dr. Turner is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Radical Remission, and the book derived from research that she was doing for her PhD. And she was working, she had an undergrad from Harvard, and she had gotten her um, master's in social work at Cal Berkeley. And then she decided, you know, as she was working with cancer patients, um, she said that she really wanted to do more. She said, I was going to too many funerals and I felt like there needed to be a change. And she came across a, one of a uh, story of a spontaneous remission. And she thought that was the only one. And she said, I, oh, who is this guy? Why doesn't everybody know him? He's a miracle. Why isn't he on the news? And that it turned out that she went home that night and she started looking and looking and found that there are, there were thousands. And she just was kind of appalled at the fact that nobody was researching them, quite frankly. So she went back to her advisors at Berkeley and said, I want to study what happens from when people leave the hospital on hospice and they go into remission outside of conventional medicine. And she wasn't trying to discredit conventional medicine. She was just looking to see what happened with these people who found healing outside of it. And so the definition of a radical remission survivor is somebody who um, beat the odds against, you know, if they had a 25% or less chance of beating the odds and they survived outside of conventional medicine for five or more years. So that was her definition. And what she did was she was sponsored by the American Cancer Society. She traveled the world and you know, went to 10 plus countries and interviewed and researched over a thousand cases of spontaneous remission. And what she found was that there was, it was not spontaneous. Um, mm -hmm. And what they did was quite radical. So she lovingly refers to them as radical remission survivors. And the 10 healing factors that we talk about in the book and in the workshop, it, that they were derived from the research. So as a, you know, following her research method, there were over 70 factors that came up that people did during this time of, of healing. And every single one of them did all 10 of these factors. So that's where the commonality is. Every one of them did these 10 healing factors. Oh, wow. I think that's amazing. And I wonder, like even now in practice and clinical practice, if you follow patients who you send home on hospice, right? How many of them actually turn to alternative, you know, medicine and actually live? Like that's what when they, I meet them. <laughs> right. What are they doing? And, you know, for individuals who live, you know, after being diagnosed with a terminal illness, such as cancer and go home on hospice, do they know where to go or who to turn to, who, who to tell their story to, to get their story out there, to see what are they doing? How do they manage to um, beat the odds, so to speak? So I think that's a, a really interesting concept because, you know, so many times in the hospital patients, oh, you go home hospice and, you know, you may not never, you never hear from them again, right? Right. Do they yeah. die? Do they survive for five more years? You know? Right. So and I think that's possibly why there was no research being done mm -hmm. because the doctors don't get the phone call, you know, even if it's two months, three months, six months, a year later, they may not get that phone call that that person passed away. And so you're right. They kind of, you know, they hand them off to the next stage appropriately. So, um, and then, so Dr. Turner really, her re research is quite remarkable and to find that there were these 10 lifestyle changes that people did and some are physical. A lot of them are more emotional and spiritual. And it's very interesting to see how they present in all the different uh, healing stories that we share in our workshop. So one thing that um, I like to make the point of, and partly why we're here talking today is that these healing factors are, you know, while they're amazing stories, if, if a cancer patient who's gone home on hospice can heal from them, what could it do for the lay person, right. right? So every one of us can learn from this research and apply these factors to our life. And even if we're not in a dire straits from a, a health condition, um, there's absolutely every reason to look at this research and, and see how it applies to our own lives. Yeah, no, it sounds very interesting. So, so what are the 10 factors? 
So of course I, you know, I, well, I should say radical remission came out in 2016 and radical hope came out in 2020, right as the pandemic hit. <laughs> so it, uh, it does not always get the accolades that it deserves, but I do love radical hope. That's, um, that's the new addition. So the 10 healing factors, um, I can just kind of read them off to you and then we can chit chat as you, as you wish, if you want to chime in here. Um, the first one is exercise. And that one is to no surprise, obviously. Um, what that became described as in this case was movement. So if you are someone who's bedridden and you start to heal, it doesn't look like you're going for, to run a marathon tomorrow, but maybe you're walking to the dining room table when you haven't walked in two months. So that's movement. So she realized that originally it was not one of the healing factors. The first book, there were nine healing factors and she added exercise to this book because when she looked back at the research, she found it wasn't about the idea of the word exercise. It was about physical movement and just doing more than you did before. And that's really a good, you know, you see the couch to five case. It's the same concept, really. It kind of stands for everybody is do more than you are now. And that is a step in the right direction. Uh, the second one is spiritual connection. And that one we take from a perspective of, you know, we're not talking about religion or anything organized as far as, you know, all spirituality welcome in the, the hands of radical remission. Um, no one, no one is, is uh, taking a stance on, on religion here. It's more about spirituality and the belief that we are all here and that there is something greater than us in this world, whether that is um, the, uh, the, a feeling that you get when you are in nature, that overwhelming grandeur that, you know, if you're overlooking Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon and the greatness, um, that could be, you know, your spiritual connection. And when we teach it, we speak about it from the perspective of meditation. Okay. And that was spiritual connection. The next one is the healing factor is called empowering yourself. And that is um, to make sure that our clients and, and those who are seeking radical remission feel comfortable with their diagnosis and their practitioners. And they know that they have a, an open dialogue and that they are heard, that they are able to ask the questions that they have and that they get answers to them and that they are respected by their practitioner so that they really feel like they believe what their practitioner is telling them to do. And that, what we always say is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what modality you choose, as long as you truly believe that it will heal you, that is important. So it's a big mindset, but a lot of times people don't, and this was one of the ones I am most passionate about because I don't feel that my sister was um, empowered in this way. I think she was um, often afraid of hurting her oncologist feelings by getting a second opinion. Um, and I think that's very common. It's uh, things I hear about with my clients now. And it's your own health and your own life. So we believe that you should be the CEO of your health and that it's, you only get one. So you really have to advocate for yourself. And I think, you know, pretty much everybody knows that you really do need to be your own advocate with your health care, no matter what it looks like. Yeah. And I'll just insert this, that, you know, our audience, you know, are nurses. So we, you know, really advocate for our patients, but I think in turn, it's important to advocate for ourselves too you know, so oh, absolutely advocacy yeah. is, is really important. So it's yeah. And, you know, I believe that the nurses, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll thank all of you who are listening now, because I can promise you that you guys are the good, the good saving graces that I hear about a lot with my clients. Um, they do feel heard with their nurses and they do feel that they have that support. And when they're feeling unsure about how to approach their doctor, even though they believe that the care they're getting is the best from this doctor, if they're not a match for bedside manner, a lot of times the nurses can massage that a little bit. Um, so there is, you're correct about that and probably often inspire the patient to advocate for themselves. Yes. And one thing that I always say for us nurses, since we're the caregivers, we want to advocate for our patients. But when it comes to ourselves, we're left on the back burner. So we have to have right. that same energy when it comes to, you know, our own care, our own physical activity, our own stress management. So we have to, you know, bring that same energy. So it's something that I definitely stress here on Absolutely. our podcast. Yeah. I think that, you know, once we get through this list, we can kind of hone in a little bit on yeah. Um, some of that too, from a self-care perspective. So the next one is a fun one. It's increasing positive emotions. And what Dr. Turner found was that um, 
if you make a little time every day, even if it's five minutes a day, if you're really feeling low, if you build that uh, happiness muscle, then the more you do it, the easier it gets. So kind of putting it on a checklist and making sure that whether it's, um, you know, looking at old pictures to make you feel nostalgic or whether it's watching a comedy show to make you laugh, participating in something like a laughter yoga, just something to get you inspired um, and positive is really important to your healing. And to pair with that is something we all we all often struggle with. And a lot of times this is a big one for uh, the, the masses is releasing suppressed emotions. So dealing with the stuff from the past. And when we work with people, oftentimes we will also suggest that they are in therapy with you know, in the hands of a therapist while we're working together, if we think this is a pretty important healing modality for them. And a lot of times they're already seeing a therapist, but it's really important to make sure that some of these are done with the right practitioner, obviously, um, in their, you know, in the right hands so that they're getting the tools that they need in, especially with releasing suppressed emotions. That one's a tough one. And a really fun one to share is following your intuition. That one is a really, um, that one, I think Dr. Turner said was one of the most surprising how concrete that was with everybody. And just really listening to that internal voice and taking the time to listen to that internal voice is also important. So, you know, whether it's knowing that you're in the right hands or you're taking maybe the right modality. If you, a lot of times we'll say, look at the 10 healing factors, which one stands out to you as the one that's hardest and that you know you need. And a lot of times that might be intuitively the one that you know you need to work on, um, but it also is probably the hardest one to work on. So uh, there's lots of, there's every single one of these has been brought to me as the most difficult. So there is no, and that's something worth saying out loud, there was no one factor that shone higher than the rest on the list of importance. These were all on an equal playing field. And so another one that no, no surprise, changing your diet, that was one of the other physical ones. And everybody did something to change their diet. There's, you know, lots of camps in the, in the cancer world on which diet is the right one. I won't really go down that path today because we could probably have an entire podcast on that. Um, but making changes to your diet to, you know, reduce, uh, you know, processed foods and eat in a more clean way. That's the, the overarching theme. And the next one is herbs and supplements. So that one is that every one of those researched survivors did something to in the world of you know herbs and supplements with the guidance of a practitioner and we are not those practitioners we are not claiming to be those practitioners we just have some resources of people that you know we will never give a resource without having multiple options for someone so a lot of times we'll just refer them back to their doctor and see if they have any recommendations or even just to, you know, we have a bunch of different naturopaths that we recommend that come, you know, through a vetting process. So be making sure you're in the right hands for speaking to someone that knows your disease and your strain and your stage and how to support you in that. And that one is the one that, you know, without a doubt across the board needs to be addressed with the practitioner. Having strong reasons for living. That was one that came loud and clear. And it's a really beautiful one to teach because we have some fun activities when we do the, the workshop to help people find and uncover what their reasons are for that. A lot of times you'll hear things about family and travel and you know things along that path. And a lot of times once you get past that, then what? What else is there? Um, that, that's when it gets really interesting to see what people come up with. And a lot of times it's really cool to experience, see the, through the eyes of each individual what, what comes up. The other day, somebody told me that they want to, um, they have a really unique home and they're, she's, a, she's an artist and she said she wanted to, um, when she passes someday, she wants to leave that, that home for uh, artists to come and do one year residencies to work on their work. So she wants to create you know, this, this foundation for that. So something greater than herself and something really oh, beautiful. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yep. Yeah, you, you disappeared for a minute. Oh, you got me. I got you now. Yeah. Okay, great. 
So yeah, so having strong reasons for living was a really uh, powerful, it is a really powerful healing factor and making sure that the research shows that those that have a reason, it doesn't matter what the reason, but having a reason have a much higher success rate uh, with longevity and with um, you know living longer and, and higher quality of life. And then last but not least, and probably one that resonates really well with this group is increasing social support and making sure that you have a community of support that understands you, that you really feel like you can be heard and that you can lean on, you know, really when you're needed. And from a caretaker perspective, I think that one is really maybe one of the most important uh, from a nurse's perspective within that um, and you know, feel free to speak to this yourself. I think having that connection with your coworkers that really understand the type of caretaking that you guys do and the the gravity of it, and and especially this year of all years, to really lean on each other and hope hopefully have at least one or two people in your in your life that really understand you. Yeah. No. I. I think that is is so important and many nurses um you know their co-workers are their support system because they know what they're going through right day in and day out um you know they're there and you know many times your co-workers it's like your second family because you spend so much time with them so social support is is important and if you don't have it at work also you know having an outlet whether it's a friend a husband a wife or or whomever but it's definitely important to to have that um, while you were talking about the 10, um, the 10 healing factors, healing factors, thank you. Yeah. Um, I was thinking that a lot of them align with um, the dimensions of wellness, like, you know, physical, spiritual, um, you know, social, a lot of them really align with wellness. And um, also while you were talking, I was thinking about everything you're saying takes intention, it does, it's not something that just happens. So you have to have an intention to listen to your intuition or your inner voice. And, and we talk about that a lot about that inner voice. What is that inner voice? What is that intuition? What is it saying? Is it good? Is it bad? Do you need to tame it? But um, I think, you know, being humans, our bodies really tell us what we need if we take the time to really listen to it. So I think yeah. that that's awesome. I think those, those, um, the, the 10 elements are, are awesome. So, so yeah, so yeah. you said you, you follow them and you kind of implement them into your own life, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love your point about intentionality too, because it's really, um, you know, what it, you know, the classic statement of, you know, how to be healthy diet and exercise, you know, people throw it out there, but if you're not intentional, that's, it makes it really difficult, even the diet and exercise, let alone all 10. Um, and that's where sometimes it can be overwhelming. If you're a deer in headlights, you know, looking at this list, oh my gosh, I can't do any of these. I'm not doing them right. all, any of them. I'm not doing any of them well. Um, so, you know, taking, you know, the coach in me wants to say, just, you know, slow down, look at one or two, what can you do first? And so really trying to figure out which one, I probably your intuition will help you guide you to which one would need to be addressed first. But I think this is what got me through I often refer to myself as a radical remission survivor because of my, um, I, I use these tools when I was grieving. And, mm -hmm. you know, I talk about after losing my sister, I kind of like went into a little cocoon and, um, and I felt I at the time was, you know, soon after um, was studying to become a health coach. And I learned, I had learned the impact of diet and how that can, you know, express itself with anxiety and different emotions. So I felt like that was a really good first step. So I started with diet and then I ended up in yoga. And then of course, yoga ends up leading into meditation and so on and so forth. So I found myself finding these little connections with each one of these factors. And at the time I didn't know radical remission existed. So when I found the book, it was like, you know, as you read in my bio, I found the roadmap that I needed to kind of articulate the important key elements that really can guide people to healing and whatever that healing is. There's a lot of people that we work with outside of the world of cancer, whether they have MS and ALS and Alzheimer's. I mean, we have, we have 
healing stories that of in all of these really rare, really aggressive diseases that don't aren't known to have reversibility. And we have healing stories in all of these, just from, you know, dedication and intentionality, like you said. Yeah. And I think um, the, the one factor that, you know, really touched me while you were reading it was having um, a strong reason for living. Cause that's really the foundation to our existence. You know, that leads to mindset, what we're thinking, what we're motivated to do, what not to do. And, you know, we talk a lot about stress management here. And when we're stressed, we can't do anything. We can't even think straight. We can't practice wellness. We can't practice self care. We can't even think of our own health and wellness. So really managing that stress is, is first and foremost to reconnect with that reason. Why are you here? What is your purpose? And then, you know, spirituality, right? So what's my reason for being here? Who's my higher purpose? What am I doing? Am I living in my purpose? So I think all of those things are, are questions we should be asking ourselves on a daily basis because we get lost. We definitely yep. get lost. I often say when I teach this that it, having strong reasons for living is almost the first thing you need to do. You need to focus on that because without that, you really, it's a lot harder to execute any of these others. And a lot of times we'll define that as, you know, what, what gets you up in the morning? You know, what gets, what gets you inspired? What gets you excited? Is it, you know, writing a book? Is it, you know, making sure you can walk your child down the aisle someday? Um, And having that vision of, you know, what, what it is for you is the reason why you might want to start exercising or change your diet or, you know, make sure that you're addressing, you're releasing, you're, you're releasing your suppressed emotions with a therapist. Um, these things aren't easy. And if you have a why, it makes it a lot more rewarding and also motivating. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. So that is a call to action for everyone who's listening to us is really evaluate what is your reason for living? I think that's so important. That's the foundation of everything. And sometimes we get so lost, we don't even remember. Mm -hmm. We're just going and going and going. So really slowing down. Like I say, take time and space to put yourself on the calendar and really do an introspective assessment of what do I need? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Right? So I I think that's, that's so important. Um, So Liz, thank you so much for um, going over the 10 healing factors with us and sharing your story. Um, Before we wrap up, do you have anything you want to say before we end? And we're not really going to end because I do have some rapid questions for you. Oh, great. Um, No, I just want to encourage the the listeners to really take the time to look at, maybe look at this list of factors and see what resonates with you and what seems hard. And maybe make that your next goal for the next couple months. And knowing that, you know, once you, once you can conquer one, the next one will be a little bit easier. It's kind of the snowball effect, I like to say. So uh, just start with one thing and, you know, try to implement it into your life first. And after that, we'll, you know, hopefully you'll see lots of success. Awesome. And Liz, how can I get in contact with you? So my website is uh, the health or just health navs, health, the word health, N-A-V-S.com, healthnavs.com for the health navigators. And we're on Facebook and Instagram at just the at symbol health navigator. And I think we're on YouTube under the same handle, but I can, I I, actually, I think I I supplied you with some of that stuff. So maybe you can pop that. Yep, populate that somewhere. (laughs) I'll put them in the show notes. Great. Well, thank you. And before you wrap up, I have a couple of questions for you. So just the first thing or statement that comes to your mind, I want you to just let us know, share with us. Sounds good. Wellness means? Wellness means peace. I know I'm stressed when? I start yelling at my family. (laughs) My go-to for stress management is? Running. The last time I had a belly laugh was? Two weekends ago, I went to visit my health navigator coworkers for the first time in 18 months we were together and we definitely had some laughs. Awesome. One thing I learned about myself during this pandemic is? The value of social support. 
Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome. I totally appreciate oh, good. spending your time with us. I love the rapid fire at the end too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. So I, I think it's fun just to kind of get to, you know, what people are thinking, you know, so it's, it's nice yeah. to get to know people on a different level. Yes. Well, I really appreciate you having me and I'm excited that we were able to get together tonight and share this information. Yes, me too. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks.